Thanks for joining our webinar today. We will be talking about how we can identify applications for the Digital Forge just across all of your operations, across all of the different printers that you might be using and materials you might be using. So from that poll, um, I gathered that we do have customers in this webinar using desktop printers, um, industrial printers, metal printers, and even an FX20 or two out there. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about just all the different kind of options we have across that whole platform. So quickly, there we go. So about me, uh, my name is Michelle Gagnon. I am a customer success engineer here at Mark Forged. And I first started here with Mark Forged back in 2016, um, just after we launched the Mark II, just before we launched Onyx, uh, when tough nylon was our primary material. So I've been around for a little bit here and I have had the pleasure to learn and grow alongside our technology um, as it's matured over the years. So my passion at this point now really does lie in enabling our customer base to fully integrate the digital forge into whatever you are doing um, and to be able to bring those uh, parts and that manufacturing to your point of need. And so today we are going to talk about a couple of different things. So over the next half hour or so we will um, look at the suite of materials that we do have available to the Mark Forged users. That's how I chose to break um, this kind of big topic up is by material. Um, and that way we can kind of hit on something for everyone. And um, we'll talk about applications that are generally successful for each material and some of the properties of each of those materials so that we have a better understanding of what um, they all work for. And then after that, I do have some note, some notes here on qualifying criteria um, that we can use to evaluate if an application does make sense to print, if it has a good value or a high ROI. And then finally, I do actually have a real life example here from one of our customers of their manufacturing floor, and we can identify some application opportunities um, in that floor together. So that is the plan. And to start off, on the wrong screen here, there we go. To start off, um, I do just wanna do a quick overview of the Digital Forge. Like I said, we have customers here that are using all of the different pieces of equipment. And so um, I do have a quick video that we're gonna watch that just goes over some of the different places where the Digital Forge is already making a, a critical difference with our customers. So we have printers that are printing in metal um, and continuous carbon fibers. And we really are able to print across lots of different customer bases. So we have applications on manufacturing floors. We have high detail parts that some customers are using for end use applications. Um, and we're able to bring all of that into the Iger software and kind of quickly, easily press print and create these parts. So we have some big names. We have some um, you know, high impact names, some really smart names. That's what they say in the video there. And we're bringing all of that to the point of need with the Digital Forge. And we'll go ahead and we'll pause that. So we're gonna jump into some of our common applications today. And as we do um, get going throughout the kind of the bulk of this presentation, if y'all do have any questions about anything that we go over, feel free to use the Q&A tool provided in Zoom and um, drop those questions in. We will do our best to answer them before we're done here today. And if we don't get to answer them, then uh, we will send out those answers after um, the end of the webinar. So let's talk about applications. All right, so I wanna start us off here looking at the Onyx Suite. So the Onyx Suite, we're all pretty familiar with here. Most of us should be. Um, and so we do have kind of the three different flavors, flavors of Onyx. So Onyx itself or classic Onyx, um, Onyx FR or FRA and Onyx ESD. So we'll talk about each of those. Um, but with our original classic Onyx, we are looking at that as our general use plastic on the Mark Forge composite machines. So here we have a whole host of applications. We can be doing durable tools, custom brackets, production parts um, in small batches. And we'll talk about batch size a little bit later. Um, functional prototypes even. I do have a, a customer example that we can look at later that has some um, functional prototypes that turned into end use parts because the prototypes were so functional. So that's pretty neat. 
Um, so with Onyx, we're generally seeing very reliable prints. Um, we're getting pretty good accuracy uh, and we're getting very good surface finish with our Onyx. And then also in general, because we are using that nylon six a base, our Onyx is generally um, very good as far as chemical, res res chemical resistance goes. Um, and then with our Onyx, our biggest concern overall that impacts uh, part performance or print performance is going to be um, humidity. So when that Onyx is exposed to a high humidity environment or um, something where, you know, maybe we're submerging those parts in water, exposing them to a water-based coolant, something like that, we may see those parts deform. And so there's different ways we can work with that, but it's something we wanna know when we consider working with Onyx is just kind of how that part is going to be used, what its environment is going to be in, um, and just making sure that that kind of compares against the uh, material data sheet. And so with that, we're able to print kind of everything we see here, whoops. So durable and strong tools, brackets and fixtures, um, like we said, low volume production parts. And there's kind of that point, right, where we have a quantity of parts that makes sense to 3D print, and then we have a quantity of parts that doesn't. Um, and then again, functional prototypes. Uh, so bouncing over to Onyx FR. So FR or FRA, um, kind of the same thing. The FRA does give us material traceability. So if you're in that aerospace industry or somewhere where we need that, um, you know, really rigid material traceability. That's what the FRA specifically is going to give us. And that is going to be a flame retardant onyx. So it's designed for use in applications where our parts have to be non-flammable. Um, the material itself is self-extinguishing. So it's a UL blue card, which is the additive manufacturing card. And it's a V0, so self-extinguishing within a certain number of seconds. And that is specifically when we have parts that are greater than um, or equal to point excuse me, three millimeters in thickness. And then, you know, if it's smaller than that, um, the properties are just going to be a little bit different. And so when we use Onyx FR, we can reinforce with any of the continuous carbon fibers um, and it's compatible with the industrial composite 3D printers across the board, all three of them now. And um, the big thing to note with Onyx FR is that we, if we do need fiber and we need the uh, flame retardant qualities, there is specifically carbon fiber FR or FRA, again, with that traceability. And then the other fibers do not have that flame retardant quality. So if we do need that um, all the way through, we're gonna use the carbon fiber FR with that. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So with the Onyx FR, um, we're looking at a couple of different categories of applications. So we have weld fixturing where the heat is going to be transferred to the Onyx parts. Um, we have aerospace clips and brackets. So that's gonna be basically um, things that we're using within like the cabins of our aerospace applications um, or kind of non-structural components for the most part there. Um, and then we also have like laser marking fixtures kind of for the same reason as that weld fixtures, we're worried about um, splatter or heat transfer in there. And then the last one we have here is the Onyx ESD. So Onyx ESD is static dissipative. Um, it's a chopped carbon fiber nylon, just like Onyx itself is, but it's a little bit different. So this one is precision engineered all the way down to the material level. And we're gonna get a tight range of surface resistivity with that. Um, so we are meeting ESD safe requirements at you know, very stringent manufacturers across the US and across the world. And we're offering, you know, kind of the same print quality, the same surface quality of Onyx. So what we're going to see is different with the ESD besides the ESD material properties is that it's going to be a little bit stiffer, a little bit stronger than Onyx. Um, but we're going to have, again, the same print capabilities. So here we're looking at applications like electronics housing or assembly, uh, really anything that has to happen in an ESD clean room. Um, we have transfer and packaging trays, again, in that um, industrial automation, and then uh, also vacuum grippers. So anything really, um, again, where we need that, that ESD uh, capability. All right. And we'll talk about the specialty plastics now. That's what I kind of just lumped together, the other three plastics. So the first one here is uh, precise PLA or PPLA. And this is going to be, you know, our easy to print, um, kind of lower end, lower price plastic for uh, concept modeling, validation, colorful parts, uh, really anything where we're worried about form, fit, and aesthetics specific specifically, and we want to have 
that slightly lower price point. So it's going to print pretty similarly in time, in material usage to Onyx, but it's going to be at a little bit of a lower price. Um, and so we also have now the Smooth TPU, that's the newest plastic material that we've launched. And that is going to be a 95A Shore um, TPU. And it's going to be basically like a rubber-like material. If you've used it, the, the filament is very flexible. Um, it feels very different than a lot of our other plastics. And so this is going to allow us to print flexible or impact absorbent parts on demand in a whole host of geometries that we maybe could not have made before. And so with the TPU, we are seeing a whole host of applications um, and we're kind of you know, starting to see new ones come out, but the ones that we're seeing already be successful are our seals and gaskets, uh, robotic grippers specifically where we're worried about not marring our parts or where we need to have a really conformal grip because that part is going to be a little bit softer than Onyx. Uh, we're going to get a better grip there if we apply a lot of pressure. We also see treads and belts. Um, so I get the question a lot, can we reinforce the TPU with Kevlar? And right now we can't. So if we're doing treads and belts, they need to be kind of lower strength, um, not ones that we are generally you know, sourcing off the, off the shelf that would have that Kevlar or other reinforcement inside. Um, not to say that that cannot happen in the future. If you guys have an application where you think that would be super useful, reach out to your local partners, let us know, um, and we're happy to have a conversation. Uh, but that's going to be our belts there. And then also we have protective coverings or really, again, anything where we're worried about having um, that abrasiveness from Onyx, where we want to have kind of a softer or less marring uh, part that we want to be working with. And then finally, also on the non-marring side, we have nylon. So a little bit of confusion actually specifically in our user group a couple of weeks ago. So I want to call this out. Um, so nylon, what we call nylon on the website, or if you buy it on the shop nowadays, this is um, previously what we've called nylon white. It's very different from our original tough nylon, which was that like kind of clear or like opalescent um, or yeah, uh, kind of like see-through plastic that we had. So this nylon is opaque. It's an unfilled thermoplastic that uses the same base as our Onyx does. It is not abrasive because it does not have that chopped carbon fiber. Um, and it makes it kind of a great plastic for ergonomic surfaces, um, for work holding, where we're again, worried about marring our parts, but maybe we need something a little bit stiffer or stronger than the TPU. And then in addition, the nylon can be more easily painted or dyed. Um, I've used like RIT dye with nylon white before, or nylon now. Uh, it takes really, really well. It's easy to paint rather than the Onyx, which you have to like prime over and then paint. Um, it just does hold that pretty well. So with the nylon white, we're looking at things like ergonomic tools, um, non-marring assembly trays, cosmetic parts. And I also see this used sometimes in like prosthetics um, and some other similar applications. All right, so... Um, yeah, and there's a question in the chat here, just are all these types of filaments 1.75 millimeters? Um, I do believe that's the case. And again, we will send out all of the answers to all of these questions after the webinar. Um, so I'm, I think that is the case, but we will confirm um, for sure in that kind of send out afterwards. All right, and again, as we have other questions, just feel free to throw them in that Q&A. So let's talk about fibers. These are my favorite, personally. Uh, so the fibers are really the unique thing that we have here at Mark Forge, the first unique thing that we had here, uh, which allows us to take those plastic parts, right, and really transform their mechanical properties uh, with our composite inlay. So I've kind of lumped these together just to make the slide, you know, make it into one slide rather than two, but just a couple of kind of bundles of fibers here. So I have the carbon fibers all three of them, the FR, FRA, all together there. And then the fiberglass and the high strength, high temperature fiberglass, I have those bundled together as well. So we'll talk about all of those as we get through them. So first, carbon fiber, kind of our flagship material here at Mark Forge. It's our unique ultra high strength continuous fiber. So when we lay carbon fiber into um, a composite based material like Onyx, so I'm gonna say that um, a couple of times through, basically I mean any of the materials that are compatible with the fibers here, right? So when we lay that into a com uh, composite based material like Onyx, we're gonna get parts that can be as strong as 6061 aluminum. They're gonna be extremely strong and stiff. 
while they're also going to be lighter than that aluminum. And then within that carbon fiber or within those parts, we can lay carbon fiber down in a bunch of different geometries. So we can try to uh, isolate where that strength is and generally, you know, try to optimize that part for its strength, its weight, its cost, um, all of those different things. And then with the carbon fiber FR, we talked about that before, but again, that is the flame retardant version of the carbon fiber. So if we do need a truly flame retardant part all the way through, uh, we will be using that FR, or again, if we need traceability, the FRA. So uh, those different fibers can be used for anything like high strength tooling and fixtures. That's probably gonna be just the carbon fiber. There's no real need to get into the FR there. Um, brackets and mounts, depending on what kinds of brackets and mounts, um, that could be carbon fiber or the FR. And then aerospace cabin components, again, getting into that um, flame retardant carbon fiber option. All right, and next we have the fiberglasses. So fiberglass is what we consider to be our entry level continuous fiber. Um, I like to call it my general use fiber when I coach my customers. We talk about maybe starting with fiberglass when we're evaluating like, do we need fiber in a part? Um, how much fiber should we be using in a part? You know, how does this affect our cost and time calculations and comparisons? I like to start with fiber and say, if we think we need something more, we'll go from there. So with that being our entry level continuous fiber, it is still capable of creating parts that are 10 times stronger than ABS when we include it with a composite based material like Onyx. And with our high strength, high temperature fiberglass, we're actually going to elevate those properties even a little bit more. Uh, so that high strength, high temperature fiberglass is defined by two characteristics, the high strength, um, even stronger, a little bit stronger than the regular fiberglass um, getting up there nearly equal to the 6061 aluminum. And then we're also gonna see that strength in high temperatures with the HSHT. And so with that, we're basically seeing that the parts are staying stiffer in more robust environments, whether that's um, high temperatures or also we do see the HSHT perform pretty well at some low temperatures as well. And so with that, um, across our fiberglasses, we're looking at uh, medium strength tooling and soft jaws, or again, just as a general use entry level fiber across our parts, uh, fiberglass is a great place to start. With the high strength high temp fiberglass, we have a couple of different operations. Um, we have polymer molds or like thermoset composite molds, anything like that, um, or even like uh, reflow fixtures for uh, over molding like wires and other components. All of those can work. Uh, depending on the batch, the temperature that we're using, what pressure they need to be subjected to, uh, and using the fiber in specific places can absolutely help there. Now, we can also use the high strength, high temperature fiberglass compared with Onyx or especially like maybe Onyx FR um, as a prototype injection mold tool. And that's going to be for very low runs. A lot of the time I'm seeing my customers say, you know, single digits or tens of runs before they're starting to see degradation of that part. But for a prototype, it does seem to work pretty well for some applications. All right, and the next one here we have is um, our Kevlar. So this is gonna be a specialized carbon fiber. This is a non-ballistic um, carbon fiber, or excuse me, a non-ballistic fiber. So specifically like not the carbon or not the Kevlar that you would usually see in like a bulletproof vest, but similar, it does absorb energy um, it's extremely tough. And when we use that with a composite base material like Onyx, we're going to get impact resistant parts that are generally like nearly immune to a catastrophic failure or a fracture. So where our carbon fiber and our fiberglass will eventually break when they are overloaded, Kevlar tends to retain that plasticity a little bit more and just kind of returns to its shape. Um, and so with these, we're generally seeing Kevlar used in robotic grippers, um, high wear applications. And that's both because the Kevlar is, um, it has decently good wear properties, but also because it's a very bright color. And if the Onyx shell wears down enough that you can start to see the Kevlar, usually that means it's time to replace that tool. So I see customers using it both ways. Um, and then any high impact applications. So on the slide here, the clip that I have is from our GIF of one of our application engineers just hitting that part with a hammer over and over again. It doesn't break, it just kind of bounces around. 
And those are the fibers. Let's check the chat. I see a couple questions in here. Um, all right. Yeah, so I see two kind of longer questions in here. We will either come back to those at the end or we will answer those after the webinar. All right, let's talk about metals. So here I've got the steel matrix materials um, and then I have the specialty metal materials coming up next. And I do call them matrix just to keep that in line with our like our plastic matrix compared to our like our fibers and our composites. Just know that that just means like um, our steel base materials, right? So we'll start here with the 17-4 stainless. Um, so that is our multi-purpose steel. It's just generally used for industrial applications. Uh, so it is heat treatable to 36 HRC, and it does uh, have about 95% of the rot strength of a cast 17-4. So when we use the 17-4 uh, pH stainless, we're able to print high strength, robust metal parts across a bunch of different applications here. So we have end of arm tooling, is one that my customers are using. Lightweight brackets, we're able to take advantage of that infill within those parts and make something that is almost as strong as rot, but a whole bunch lighter. And then we also have just general high wear tooling, anything where our composite tools might be wearing down. Steel is a pretty good, or the 17.4 pH stainless is a good step up. Uh, so stepping over to the H13 tool steel. So this is going to be um just a little bit of a harder material so it has better material properties um, at high temperatures and it's very versatile for us to work with for our customers to work with so h13 can be heat treated up to uh, 45 hrc it has an ultimate tensile strength of 1500 mpa and um, our customers are using it for all kinds of things like tool bodies we also have brazing fixtures which we'll see here in um another one of our other metals as well in just a minute. Um, but we have that and then we have anything where our hardness or our heat resistance is required up to a point. If we need higher heat resistance, we'll talk about Inconel in a minute, but that's going to be kind of a general use, you know, high heat, high hardness metal. And so I do have a couple of notes here. So we have cutting tool bodies where we need um, the actual, you know, custom tool. Sometimes we will use inserts for the actual cutting edge because the H13 might not be strong enough or hard enough for that. But the bodies are usually good to make in the H13. We do have the brazing fixtures. And then I have a note here about plastic injection, molding, tooling, and prototypes. Um, so here I want to be really clear about injection, molding, tooling. So we do have some customers who are trying this out. They're being, um, we're seeing various levels of success here with the injection molding tool, injection molding tooling. But the big thing that we're seeing is um, the infill in our parts, which is the standard setting, is going to hold heat a bit more than um, a traditional solid fill part. And so with these um, printed injection mold tools, we really wanna consider cooling whether that's um, within the part, whether that's between cycles um, or just you know, with the, the material in there, however we wanna do that. Uh, we can also print the part solid. So we, we can have a more similar cycle time to that original cast or however we were making that part before. And so the last one that we have here is copper. So our copper is going to conduct heat and electricity better than our traditional metals. Um, and then specifically, Mark Forge copper is a pure copper, so we're going to see better conductivity characteristics than any kind of alloy copper that we'd see on a DMLS machine. And so here, um, we're seeing our customers start to use copper in more complex geometries where normally conventional fabrication would be really labor intensive expensive, just difficult to do. The Mark Forge copper prints a little bit more easily and can be Sorry, team, um, lost my headphones there. I think they're back. Let me double check. Yeah, looks like we're good. Oops. All right, so we'll move on to the specialty metals. All right, so here I have A2 and D2. These are gonna be generally lumped together, um, but I split them out to make the slide look pretty. So here we're working with um, cold work tool steels defined by their high hardness, their um, specifically high hardness after heat treatment. So when they come out of the center oven, they're not going to be as hard as they could be. We're going to look at heat treating them as a post-processing operation. 
So our A2 tool steel is generally considered our universal cold work steel. It's gonna give us a combination of wear resistance and um, pretty high toughness. Whereas D2 tool steel is gonna be a little bit harder. It's going to be a little bit more wear resistant, but less tough. So we're seeing both being used for cutting and forming tools, whether that's um, punches, dies, um, stamping applications. Um, I even have here, so we have the, the middle part here with the D2 picture is a, an actual cutting blade um, with an onyx fixture to, to bring it down to cut it or to cut the part. And then the last thing we have here is Inconel. So Inconel 625 is a nickel chromium based super alloy. So it's super resistant to corrosion and it's very strong at very high temperatures. So higher than that H13 is gonna go. So this allows us to create functional prototypes for um, high heat and you know, highly corrosive environments, or we can create um, tools and end use parts that can be used in those environments. So here in the picture, we do have a crucible where we're holding a specific component in place while it is um, put through this application that we can see here with, with the flames. And so here we're seeing Inconel uh, 625, it's going to meet chemical requirements of ASTM B443, and it's going to maintain an ultimate tensile strength of 500 megapascals at 600 degrees Celsius. All right, and before we jump into the next thing, just a couple of quick questions in the chat. Um, so a uh, quick question here, so the steel materials, what printer do we need? So that is going to be the Metal X system. Um, I have a question in here for what is the maximum temperature, but I don't know which material we're asking for. So feel free to throw that question back in there. Um, and then I see some other questions here that I think we'll get to at the end. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I did have another video here, given that our volume sharing is not working, we'll just go ahead and skip that, but we can link this out to you guys at the end. Um, just some different ways that our company or our customer Siemens is using some MarkForge technology across both the metal and composite spaces. There we go. All right, so we'll change gears a little bit here and we'll talk about um, some criteria we can consider when we qualify our applications. So basically here we're consider considering, you know, I have all these applications, I have all these ideas now, um, but which ones are going to be highest value to me? Which ones are actually going to make a difference in my overall, you know, day-to-day -day operations? So here we'll talk about some different categories of criteria that we can consider. And I've broken it out again by plastics, fibers, and metals, but just give me one second here. All right. So first we'll look at plastics. So if we were to make a plastic only part, um, if we were to start looking across our you know, shop floor or even our office and we were to think, you know, what can I print with plastic only? There's gonna be a lot of options. I can tell you in my office alone right here, I have quite a few things that I printed just to make my life easier. So when we consider printing with plastic, um, considering we have all of these options, we're gonna end up finding a whole bunch of potential applications that maybe are not as valuable as the couple of needles in the haystack that we'll eventually kind of find here. So when we're considering printing plastic only parts, we really wanna consider uh, these criteria here. So uh, what is the cost to traditionally manufacture this part? What is the time it takes to traditionally manufacture this part? And so when we think about those, we can then put that part file directly into Iger we can look at how long it's going to take to print. We can look at how much it's going to cost to print. And we can consider, you know, how many do I need to make? Um, is the, the batch costing of the traditional manufacturing, does that play a part here? But we can consider all of that. So we get into like the batch size criteria as well. And so with all of those, once we kind of put that in Iger, we've done the quick economic um, business case review. We then wanna consider a couple other things. So plastic only parts are not going to be super strong. In general, the onyx obviously is a little bit stronger than things like PLA and ABS, but we really wanna consider that working environment. So um, is plastic going to work? Is it going to be strong enough? Um, or alternatively, some other things we might consider are, you know, is this part going to be used in a kind of chemically corrosive environment? 
in that case, we might say that Onyx has a better chance of working out than some of our uh, plastic parts that we might traditionally manufacture, or even some metals, depending on what that environment looks like. So we do want to consider that working environment um, and take that completely into account. And then we also want to consider our design guide compliance. So does this part meet all of the criteria of the design guide? Does it have the right feature sizes? Um, are the overhangs you know, going to be easy to support? Everything like that. Um, and if not, then the other question is, like, do we have flexibility to design for additive. And that seems like kind of a simple, simple question, but I do have customers, you know, from time to time who come in and say, I need to print this part, but I need it to be an exact one-to-one -one replica of something else. And we'll look at it and say, well, that something else was designed for injection molding or some other manufacturing process. And, you know, it's just not a good fit for 3D printing as it is, like, can we make some changes? And so if we um, are open to that design flexibility or we meet that design guide compliance, our business case is good and our material compatibility is going to be good, then, you know, I'd say, let's go for it. Let's try some stuff out with plastics and see how they work. Now, when we do need a little bit more strength here um, or more functional, you know, capabilities, we'll look at adding those fibers. So again, we're going to look at the cost and time to tr traditionally manufacture, compare that to Iger. Now in Iger, when we add fibers, we're gonna have lots of different options for how we add those fibers. And so we wanna make sure that we are taking into account like the optimal fiber pathing. And so if you're not super familiar with that, we do have a webinar, I believe it's on our YouTube that um, my coworker Kat presented last summer and it goes over kind of all of the different options we have for laying fiber in the part so that we can be pretty optimal. We also do have the simulation tool for carbon fiber right now in Iger that's free for everyone to use. So feel free to go and play around with that and kind of figure out what your optimal amounts of fiber are within your part. And then we'll take that information and we'll compare it to that traditional manufacturing. So also with fiber, we want to consider um, the forces that we're going to apply, the load cycles, make sure we're using the right fiber. We have some content online about that. Um, we want to consider the part lifespan expectancy. So does this part, you know, continuously get slammed into over and over and over again? Um, if so, is carbon fiber maybe not the best option if we want this part to last, especially given that carbon fiber is a little bit more expensive than everything else, right? So we want to consider all of those kind of functional requirements and then also our weight requirements. So when we add fiber to a part that was plastic only before, it's going to add some amount of weight, especially when we're adding like a lot of fiberglass, for example. Uh, so we want to make sure that we are kind of considering those weight requirements, but also considering the benefits that we get from using 3D printing, um, specifically the light weighting of some of our tools. And then finally, with our metals. So here we're looking at a lot of the same criteria, right? What's the cost and time to manufacture? Um, what does the batch size look like? How does that affect our cost and time? Um, here in metal, we have a couple specific consideration. So the first one that I want to call out is the batch size. So that's really where we're going to have this kind of crossover between um, additive metal manufacturing and, you know, injection, metal injection molding. So depending on how big your parts are, how complex they are, and how many you need, it may make sense to um, print them. It may make sense to have them injection molded just because the printing is going to take too much time, being that it's a serial process. Or there may be some kind of in the middle option where, um, you know, maybe we're printing some of our tooling for some other um, operations and then we're, you know, able to use our, um, our save time there to make up for printing some of our parts, something like that. So we want to really just consider all of that and make sure that we are uh, thinking about our batch size critically because that process is serial. Now with metals, we'll also look at our hardness, our strength requirements, make sure we are choosing the right metal and make sure we understand what that metal is going to be like when it comes out of the sinter oven. So when our metals come out, they're not going to be, like we said, as hard as they could be. Some of our metals can be annealed, they can be work hardened, um, all kinds of different things like that. And so when we consider our metal parts, we want to know, do I need to do post-processing operations? And then how does that affect my cost and time? to 3D print this part and how does that compare against traditional manufacturing? So with all of those kind of what we're looking at is maybe getting rid of a bunch of suboptimal applications within you know, your potential suite of metal parts that you could print. 
So once we've kind of looked at all of that, we found the business case, we found um, the parts that are going to be, you know, a really good fit for us. The last thing we really, really need to consider, I put it in bold here because it's most important in metal than it is in anything else, is our design guide compliance. So with metal parts, if we don't meet the design guide criteria, and if we um, don't meet criteria for like center stability, we may not have, or probably not going to have successful parts. And this is kind of everything from feature size to um, aspect ratios. We even have notes in there about how long your part should be kind of on the hot print bed or how long of a print is like the maximum. So it's five days. If you have a part that takes longer than five days to print, um, we're gonna start to see kind of less good uh, qualities and characteristics coming out of the center oven, depending on how long it sits. We're gonna see you know, worse and worse characteristics. Um, and then with that also, if we, you know, if we don't have that design guide compliance or that flexibility, we need to be really, really honed in going back to our, our costs and our time to manufacture and our post-processing. Um, we need to be really, you know, honed into the fact that we may need to do multiple iterations of this print um, to dial in critical tolerances and we may still need to do some post-processing. Um, and manufacturing afterwards, assuming that part is able to print and center successfully. So again, with metal, just some more characteristics um, to consider there. If you all are looking at a metal application and you're not sure if it's going to be a good fit, go ahead and reach out to your local partners and just send them an email and ask. If they, you know, if they know, they'll be able to answer you. If not, they will engage the customer success team, which is me and Kat, and we will do kind of a full review of, excuse me, of your part. Um, the application, the design, and we'll let you know kind of what we think. So I have a couple of different customers I'm doing that with right now. So feel free to reach out to your partners and we can give you some guidance. All right, I'm pulling up those questions one more time. Just make sure there's, or see if there's anything easy. Nope, looks like the same stuff, cool. All right, like I said, throw any more questions in the chat and I do wanna wrap us up with a quick little activity. So here I have a shop floor. It's a, a manufacturing environment from one of our customers. So I wanna call our attention to two parts of this. The first one is the robotic cell right in the front. So this is a manufacturing cell, automated manufacturing, where we have a robotic arm that is picking up um, pieces of sheet metal that have been cut out or stamped. And then it's going to bring it over to a press. That's the green kind of plate on the left here. And we're going to form those um, pieces of sheet metal into brackets. And then the, the robot will take them out and put them somewhere where they're done. The other place I'd like to call our attention to is our friends working in the back here, just some kind of workstation where it looks like they are organizing parts, inspecting parts. Um, I'm not 100% sure what they're doing, but there's some people back there. So between these two kind of sections of the manufacturing floor, I just want everybody to take a minute and um, maybe think about what we could 3D print here. And while we do that, I'm gonna launch one more poll. Ooh, looks like um, responses have started to trickle here. So I'll leave that up for just another, maybe like 10 seconds. And then um, we can talk about these results and we can talk about this application. So let's go ahead and end that poll. And really quickly, let me see if I can share these results with you guys. So it's pretty interesting. Um, most people are doing some combination of manufacturing, tooling, and fixturing, which I'm aware is a huge category, right? And then also prototyping. So um, those results, I think they'll pop up on your screen when I share them like that. It's just cool to see um, kind of what people are doing. All right. So I've got a couple of different applications here that I want to call out that our uh, customers were using. So these are all real parts that our customer was um, printing within these different uh, sections of their manufacturing floor. So we'll start off here with the robot. So within that robot, um, near those end effectors, robotic end of arm tooling end effectors, we've been talking about those for a long time within the Mark Forge space. Um, our customers here do have two different variations of the same tool that they use. So they started with Onyx. Um, I think it's Onyx and, and fiberglass reinforcement, but or some kind of reinforcement is in there. 
So they started with onyx, but they are picking up uh, metal pieces over and over and over again. And those metal pieces have some sharp edges. And so with that, the onyx components wear down eventually. So what the customer started to do was say, you know, we have these onyx tools, um, we'll continue to use them, but as they uh, continue to wear out, we now have this metal printer, we're going to start creating metal tools to replace those onyx ones and eventually swap over. Now they do still have the onyx tools in some cases for some places where they need to have a softer tool um, because they're worried about marring or anything like that. So they do have those options both, um, but just kind of a cool example of how we're printing different tooling. And then there is a bonus application here. There it is. Uh, so that bonus application is up at the top of our kind of composite gripper picture here. And it's shown again on the green background picture. So that's gonna be just some kind of conformal bracket here. It looks like they are using that to route the pneumatics. Um, to a different place or to somewhere specific within those grippers. And so with that, it's just a nice easy part that they were able to print um, that's going to be highly durable and that's going to allow them to have kind of the custom geometry that they need. So when we think about end of arm tooling um, and end of arm components in general, we have some benefits of the 3D printing. So that is they're lightweight, they're fast to print um, compared to like if we had to machine these a lot of the time, especially when they are complex geometries. Um, we can have internal channels, so I didn't talk about here because it's not as important, but we do have some customers who are doing vacuum channels with their end of arm tooling, so we have the ability to do that as well. Um, and then again, the composite parts are going to be non-marring, depending on what material we are using. So stepping back out, the next thing I want to talk about is the um, press itself. So this one's really cool because they're doing the entirety of their forming with Mark Forge printed tools, um, or just about all of it. I think there may be a, a metal component or two on here. This one in the back looks kind of shiny. But so what we're seeing here is um, bases of tools that are printed. We then have interchangeable conformal um, nests and uh, presses or forming tools that we can see. And so the customer is able to easily switch out these tools, have a lot of different tools on hand, easily test and prototype those tools. Uh, and then the other cool thing here, we're starting to see it in this front tool a little bit, I do believe, is we have some wear resistance, or excuse me, some wear indication. So as that tool continues to wear out, we'll start to see the fiberglass or the Kevlar that they've used to reinforce that part. And we'll know it's time to switch that tool out. And then on the press, there is actually one other tool they're using, just call it um, out here really quickly. So in the back of this picture, really blurry, we see there's a bar that the press uses to kind of guide it as it raises and lowers. Well, really close to the camera here, there's another bar. And on that bar, they actually have just like a little stop um, or a, a, um, a piece that's added on here just to make sure we're protecting our critical components as we reach those ends or limits of motion. Oops, go back one. So our benefits of 3D printing there, it's quick to build. Um, we can do multiple operations because we have multiple tools because they're easy to make. Um, it's going to be non-marring. We have that wear indication, all that fun stuff. Um, one more quick one here that's pretty hard to spot in the picture, um, but just another neat little conformal bracket of some sort. So here again, it looks like we are routing pneumatics um, and what they've done here is they've just added this onyx part to the tray where the robot drops the pieces in after they've been formed. And so with that little mounting bracket, it's just quick to build rather than, you know, if you didn't have the printer, maybe we're working on finding some other way to affix that and it's going to be uh, not repeatable or kind of a pain. Uh, we're able to prioritize our machine bandwidth. So if we could not find another way to do that and we ended up having to machine this, whether it was out of metal or like a UHMW, um, then we're taking time away from our machine operations. So here we're able to prioritize, you know, high, um, highly critical operations on those CNCs while we print less critical things on our printer. And then also what's neat about this is because it's Onyx and it can be reinforced, just in case that robot were ever to crash as it's trying to put those pieces in, it's going to be a pretty durable part. It's going to hold up pretty well. All right. And the last application I want to talk about, I don't think they're actually using this application in this picture, but we talked about our friends in the back there. So they're doing some kind of manual work. Um, they are 
picking stuff up, putting it down. It looks like, you know, they've got a whole bunch of stuff going on in that application. And so this is just one more part that actually was printed by our customer. I just think it's used somewhere else in their facility. Um, but this is going to be custom tool holding. So here our benefits are a little bit more holistic than some of the other ones we've talked about so far, right? So here we have highly customizable um, parts that we can make. And so it looks like they've got kind of a setup where the caliber can slide right in and it's perfectly cradle cradled. So that's really nice. Um, with you know, our tool organization or anything like this, um, we're replacing fewer tools per period, whether that's month, year, quarter, whatever. And we're spending less time looking for misplaced tools. If you're like me, you put something down, you never see it again. So here, at least it has a home. You can put it in its home and you know where it is. So again, a little bit more holistic of benefits, but something else to consider, um, especially if your printer has some downtime and you're thinking, how can I optimize my operations? How can I make myself more efficient? So let me go through and um, see what kind of questions we've got in here that I can answer for you. Um, so there's a question in here. Do we have any rigid materials that will bond with TPU? Uh, so it's a good question. We don't have anything right now that we would like print with TPU. So we would print like a TPU only part and then maybe an Onyx part. Uh, and we don't have any um, fibers right now that are you know, being used with the TPU. So we do have a couple other options though. So what we can do is create a hybrid part. The last, I think it's the last webinar we did here with the customer success um, program was about creating hybrid parts. And uh, there we focused a lot more on like composites and metals, but here we could absolutely do, you know, an onyx and carbon fiber body of a part with just like a printed TPU um, contact surface. So we have some options there uh, and if, you know, if we have um, more questions about that, please reach out to your partners and we can uh, kind of do a deeper dive consultant. Um, let's see, what else? Sorry, it just bounced. Um, are the steel materials able to be used right off the printer or do they need heat treating? That's a great question. Um, so, the, the answer is depending on your center oven. So when we think about the steel materials, um, it depends if you have a center one or a center two, they have some slightly different uh, heating profiles that we can use. So heating and timing that we, um, you know, leave those parts in for and heat them up to. And so with that, we can do a bunch of different things. So we can do an annealing process in the center one, um, with the center two, I believe, and we can, we'll follow up with this afterwards, but I believe we are able to heat treat those materials to an extent. Um, so you can, you can do some post-processing with them after use, um, but generally we're going to be looking at heat treating them after sintering in order to get to those like preferred hardness values, those Rockwell hardnesses. Um, and so with that, generally, if, if you're looking for the tool steel properties, you're going to end up doing some kind of post-process heat treatment. Um, seems to be the, the vibe there, the general gist with my customers. All right, let's see, we'll do one more and then um, we'll wrap up and send you guys the rest of these answers. Um, why does additive H13 for injection molding hold heat longer than traditional tooling? This is a great question. Um, I do wanna to touch on this. So specifically, um, we can, you know, we can work with you guys to figure out um, the different sciences or the different heat that's being held in your specific parts. I don't have, you know, that, you know, scientific breakdown. I just know that that's what's been observed with our customers is that the, um, the air within the infill and the infill itself is holding that heat a little bit longer, um, whether that's because it's heating up and it can't cool up through the metal, maybe, I'm not 100% sure, but we are seeing across the board with our customers who have tried doing tooling that the infill does hold the heat longer. Uh, so with that, the solutions that we've seen be successful with our customers, which is you know what I recommended earlier, is again, to add cooling through your part or to print it solid um, or to adjust your cycle times so that you know there is time for that part to cool in between cycles and shots of material. All right. Um, cool. 
I think that's going to be it. There's some other questions here we will um, get out to you guys at the end. And I think we're going to wrap this up. I don't know. Kat, is this how we usually end things? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Um, You're welcome. That is going to be it for today. Yeah, uh, we'll have another one next month on March fifteenth, and so we hope to see you then. But we appreciate you guys joining us for today. And like Michelle said, the rest of the questions we will answer, and then we will be sending out through an email along with the recording of this presentation. So thanks so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, team.